This is Audible. Brought to you by Penguin. Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, by Serhi Plochi, read by Leighton Pugh. Prologue Around 7 a.m. on April the 28th, 1986, Cliff Robinson, a 29-year-old chemist working at the Forsmark nuclear power plant, two hours drive from Stockholm, went to brush his teeth after breakfast. In order to get from the washroom to the locker room, he had to pass through a radiation detector, just as he had done thousands of times before. This time was different, though. The alarm went on. It made no sense, thought Robinson, as he had never even entered the control area where he might have absorbed some radiation. He went through the detector a second time, and again it went on. Only on the third try did the alarm fall silent. Finally, an explanation. The damn thing had simply malfunctioned. Robinson's job at the plant was monitoring radiation levels. How ironic, he thought, that the detector had chosen him to show how vigilant the system was. Good thing it had come back to its senses. Robinson went on with his duties, all but forgetting the unexpected alarm. But when he returned to the area later that morning, he saw a line of workers who also could not pass the detector without setting it off. Instead of checking the alarm, Robinson took a shoe from one of those waiting near the detector and took it to the lab for examination. What he discovered sent shivers up his spine. I saw a sight that I will never forget, he recalled. The shoe was highly contaminated. I could see the spectrum rising very quickly. Robinson's first thought was that someone had detonated a nuclear bomb. The shoe emanated radioactive elements that they did not normally detect at the plant. He reported the findings to his boss, and from there they were passed on to the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority in Stockholm. The authorities in the capital thought the problem was probably in the power plant itself, and the four smart workers were promptly evacuated. Radioactive testing of the plant began but turned up nothing, and after a few hours it was clear that the plant was not the cause of the contamination. The bomb hypothesis was ruled out as well. The radioactive elements did not fit a bomb profile. With radioactivity levels also high at other nuclear power stations, it was apparent that the radioactive particles were coming from abroad. The calculations and wind direction pointed southeast to one of the world's two nuclear superpowers, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Could something terrible have happened there? But the Soviets were silent. The Swedish Radiation Safety Authority contacted Soviet officials, who denied that anything taking place on their territory might have caused nuclear contamination. But safety services in the Scandinavian countries continued to register abnormally high levels of radiation. In Sweden, the level of gamma radiation was 30 to 40 percent higher than normal. In Norway, it had doubled, and in Finland, it was six times the norm. Two radioactive gases, xenon and krypton, byproducts of the nuclear fusion of uranium, were moving across Scandinavia, a region covering not only Finland, Sweden and Norway, but also Denmark. Tests indicated that the source of the radioactive pollution, wherever it might be, was continuing to emit dangerous substances. The Swedes repeatedly called three Soviet agencies in charge of nuclear power management and generation, but they denied knowledge of any accident or explosion. The Swedish Minister for the Environment, Birgitta Dol, declared that the country responsible for the spread of radioactivity was violating international agreements by withholding vital information from the world community. There was no response. Swedish diplomats reached out to their former foreign minister, Hans Blix, now in Vienna, heading the International Atomic Energy Agency. The agency was also in the dark. It was not clear what to expect. Although radiation levels were high, they did not yet pose a direct threat to human life and vegetation. But what if the contamination continued or even increased? And what had happened there, behind the Iron Curtain along the Soviet border? 
Was it the start of a new world war or a nuclear accident of enormous proportions? One way or another, the world would be involved. It was involved already, but the Soviets remained silent. Part 1 Wormwood Chapter 1 Congress It was a big day. Many in Moscow and throughout the Soviet Union believed that it signaled the dawn of a new era. On the cold winter morning of February the 25th, 1986, the temperature during the previous night had fallen to minus two degrees Fahrenheit, close to 5,000 warmly dressed men and women, including senior Communist Party and state officials, military officers, scientists, directors of the large state companies, and representatives of workers and collective farmers, the toiling masses, descended on Red Square in downtown Moscow, which was decorated with a huge portrait of Vladimir Lenin. They were delegates to the Communist Party Congress, the 27th since the founding of the party by a handful of idealistic social democrats in the late 19th century. Their mission was to chart a new course for the country for the next five years. Once they reached the Kremlin, the crowds moved towards the Palace of Congresses, a modern glass-and-concrete building decorated with white marble plates. It had been erected in 1961 on the site of buildings belonging to the 16th-century Tsar, Boris Godunov. The Soviet premier at the time, Nikita Khrushchev, wanted to rival the Great Hall of the People that Mao Zedong had opened in Beijing in 1959. The Chinese palace could seat 10,000 people. The envious Soviets increased the seating capacity of their palace from 4,000 to 6,000 by putting almost half the building underground, where most of the seats of the meeting hall are located. Only the balcony seats with boxes are above ground level. When it came to party congresses, which convened every five years, the Soviet leaders imposed a limit of 5,000 participants, no matter how large the membership of the Communist Party became, and it was growing quickly, since filling the hall to capacity would have meant sacrificing the comfort of those in attendance. There was no venue in the Soviet Union, short of sports arenas, that could have seated more. Khrushchev inaugurated the new Palace of Congresses in October 1961, in time for the 22nd Party Congress. The Congress decided to remove the corpse of Joseph Stalin from the mausoleum it then shared with that of Lenin, and it adopted a new program for building a communist society, with its foundations to be in place by the early 1980s. Now, in 1986, the delegates to the 27th Congress had to take stock of what had been accomplished. The record was dismal, to say the least. As the population had increased, the economy had slowed, and the possibility of a complete breakdown was becoming ever more likely. The growth of national income, which Soviet economists had estimated at 10% in the 1950s, had fallen to barely 4% in 1985. The Central Intelligence Agency in the United States had made even grimmer estimates, putting the growth rate at 2 to 3 percent, and later reducing even that estimate to approximately 1 percent. With its goals for communism nowhere in sight, the economy in a tailspin, the Chinese launching their economic reforms by introducing market mechanisms, and the Americans rushing ahead not only in economic development, but also in the arms race under the leadership of the unfailingly optimistic Ronald Reagan, the Soviet leadership had lost its way. The people, ever more disillusioned with the communist experiment, had become despondent, and yet, with the communist religion in crisis, it suddenly appeared to have found a new messiah in a relatively young, energetic and charismatic leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. This was to be the 54-year-old Gorbachev's first Congress as General Secretary of the Party, and he was well aware that the eyes of the party leadership, of Soviet citizens, and indeed of the entire world, were on him. The previous three years had become known as the era of Kremlin funerals. Leonid Brezhnev, who had ruled the Soviet Union since 1964, died a sick man in November 1982. The former head of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, 
who had inherited his position, spent half his brief tenure in a hospital bed and died in February 1984. His sickly successor, Konstantin Chernenko, followed suit in March 1985. It looked as if the leaders were about to take the country to the grave with them. Economic difficulties aside, they kept sending young boys to Afghanistan, where the Soviet army had been bogged down since 1979, and preparing for nuclear confrontation with the West. KGB stations abroad were instructed to drop everything and look for signs of imminent nuclear attack. Now hopes ran high in both party and society that Gorbachev, who was full of ideas, would be able to reverse the deadly trend. Hopes of rapprochement were rising in the West as well. In the United States, Reagan, tired of Soviet leaders dying on him, was looking for someone with whom he could do business. His close ally, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain, told him that Gorbachev was such a man. Reagan's first meeting with Gorbachev in Geneva in December 1985 was not without tension, but it opened the door to more productive subsequent dialogue, which was conducted not only by personal meetings and diplomatic channels, but also by public pronouncements. In January 1986, Gorbachev surprised Reagan by putting forward a Soviet program for nuclear disarmament. It was expected that he would further challenge the American president on disarmament in his forthcoming speech to the party congress. Gorbachev, preoccupied with finding solutions to the multiple Soviet crises, put considerable thought and effort into his report to the Congress. In the late fall of 1985, he summoned his two closest advisers, his chief assistant, Valery Boldin, and Alexander Yakovlev, the former Soviet ambassador to Canada, to the state resort near Sochi on the Black Sea coast. Pierestroika, the radical restructuring of the Soviet political and economic system still lay ahead. Eventually, Yakovlev would become known as the grandfather of the movement. The key concept at the time was uskorenye, or acceleration. It was believed that the system was basically sound and simply needed a boost by means of scientific and technical progress, the Soviet term for technological innovation. In the days leading up to the Congress, Gorbachev shut himself up at home, reading his long speech aloud and timing it. Read without a break or interruptions, it would be more than six hours in length. As Gorbachev practiced his oratorical skills, the delegates to the Congress kept themselves busy visiting the stores of Moscow rather than galleries and museums. Having come from all over the country, they were preoccupied with their own affairs, wrote Gorbachev's aide, Boldin, who had co-authored the speech. They had to buy many things for themselves, their family members and acquaintances, who had ordered so much that it would be hard to transport even by train. Most of the delegates came from the provinces, which were dogged by the shortages of agricultural products and consumer goods that had become a constant feature of Soviet life in the 1980s. The party leadership, unable to alleviate the shortages for the general population, did its best to supply the party elite. In hotels designated for Congress delegates, party officials opened special branches of grocery and department stores, to which hard-to-get products were brought from all parts of the Soviet Union. There were stylish suits and dresses, shoes, caviar, cured meat, sausages, and last but not least, bananas— all items desired by average Soviet citizens not only in the provinces, but also in the much better supplied metropolitan centers such as Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. The post office administration opened a special branch to handle all the merchandise that the delegates shipped back from Moscow. For high-ranking party officials from the provinces and directors of large enterprises who had access to scarce goods at home because of their political power and connections, participation in the Congress offered a different kind of opportunity. They used the time to lobby Moscow's potentates and ministers, asking for money and resources for their regions and firms. They also worked hard to maintain old networks of friends and acquaintances and make useful new connections. 
networking meant drinking, often to excess, a hallmark and curse of the Soviet managerial style. The previous year Gorbachev, alarmed by the level of alcoholism among the general population, had launched an anti-alcohol campaign. Party and state officials in particular were liable to prosecution for drunkenness. Vitaly Vrublevsky, a close aide to the all-powerful party boss of Ukraine, Volodymyr Sherbitsky, head of the Ukrainian delegation, recalled an episode in which KGB guards charged with checking passes to the Congress smelled alcohol on one of the delegates and reported him to senior officials. The case, which involved a regional secretary in Ukraine's mining area of Luhansk, was reported all the way to the top of the party apparatus. The secretary was expelled from the party on the spot, recalled Vrublevsky, who had barely avoided detection himself after spending a night drinking with some of the first cosmonauts, the Soviet equivalent of rock stars. Volodymyr Sherbitsky, sitting at the head table, kept glancing at his delegation, recalled Vrublevsky, and, as ill luck would have it, my head kept drooping. He was saved by a friend who would squeeze his knee from time to time to wake him up in the middle of the speeches. Viktor Bruchanov, the fifty-year-old director of the Chernobyl nuclear power station in Ukraine, was a member of the 1986 Ukrainian delegation. It was the first Congress that Bruchanov was attending after many years as a loyal party member and high-ranking manager. Three-quarters of the other delegates were also there for the first time, but managers such as Bruchanov accounted for slightly more than 350 of the party delegates, roughly 7% of the total. Below average in height, slim and erect, with curly black hair that he combed back and a somewhat awkward smile, Bruchanov made the impression of a kind and fair man. His subordinates valued him as a good engineer and effective manager. He was hardly a drinker. If anything, Bruchanov was a workaholic. He put in long hours, spoke little, and was known as one of a rare breed— a Soviet manager who got things done while showing consideration to his subordinates. The privilege of becoming a delegate was recognition for the work Bruchanov had done at the helm of the third most powerful nuclear power station in the world. He had built it from scratch, and now it had four nuclear reactors running, each producing one million megawatts of electrical energy, MWE. Two more reactors were under construction— and the station had overfulfilled its planned targets for 1985, producing 29 billion megawatts of energy. Bruchanov had received two high Soviet awards for his work, and many believed that he was poised to receive an even higher distinction, the Order of Lenin, as well as the gold star of a hero of socialist labor. In late November 1985, the Ukrainian Supreme Soviet in Kiev had marked his fiftieth birthday with a commendation. His selection as a delegate, with the corresponding lapel pin, was a distinction in its own right, equal if not superior to most government awards. When, on the eve of Bruchanov's birthday, a reporter came from Kiev to Pripyat, where the Chernobyl plant was located, to interview him about his accomplishments and plans for the future, Bruchanov, usually a man of few words, suddenly opened up to the visitor. He recalled a cold winter day in 1970 when he had come to Chernobyl and rented a room in the local hotel. Only thirty-five years old at the time, he had been appointed director of a power plant that was yet to be built. To be frank, it was scary at first, Bruchanov told the reporter. That was then. Now Bruchanov was running an enterprise with thousands of highly qualified managers, engineers, and workers. He also bore de facto responsibility for running the company town of Pripyat, which housed close to 50,000 construction workers and plant personnel. He even complained to the reporter about the need to divert people and resources from the nuclear station to ensure the smooth running of the city's infrastructure— but there were also payoffs from the father of the city status that had been thrust upon him. Before and during the Congress, photographs and profiles of Bruchanov were published in local and regional newspapers, including the one in Chernobyl. 
photos of the Kiev regional delegation taken in Red Square during the Congress and then upon the group's return to Ukraine show Bruchanov dressed in a fancy muskrat fur hat and short sheepskin coat with a mohair scarf around his neck, all expensive and hard to get in the Soviet Union at the time, tokens of the prestige and power of their owner. Bruchanov did not need the shop set up for rank-and-file Congress delegates, but time in Moscow gave him the opportunity to meet with colleagues in the industry and lobby the party's central committee and the Ministry of Energy and Electrification, which supervised his plant. The task was relatively easy, given that many officials in both places had once worked at the Chernobyl plant that Bruchanov ran. On the morning of February the 25th, 1986, Viktor Bruchanov and his fellow deputies took their seats in the Kremlin Palace of Congresses, in the center of the hall before the podium. For those like Bruchanov who were attending their first party congress, the ritual opening presented an interesting spectacle whose main features went back to Stalin's times. At ten in the morning, the party's Politburo members, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, marched to the podium. Like most people, Bruchanov knew them from their portraits, which were displayed on public buildings all over the Soviet Union. Among them was the head of the KGB, Viktor Shebrikov, whose portrait would survive for decades in the Pripyat Palace of Culture. Like everyone else, Bruchanov rose to his feet to welcome the leaders with applause. Once it subsided, Gorbachev made his way to the podium. Comrade delegates! declared the General Secretary, his voice betraying his excitement. At Communist Party Congresses of Union Republics and Territorial and Oblast Party Conferences, 5,000 delegates were chosen to attend the 27th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, CPSU. There are 4,993 delegates attending the Congress. Seven people are absent for valid reasons. This gives us a basis to commence the work of the Congress. There were no objections. The Congress began its proceedings. Among the first items on the agenda was paying tribute to those who had passed away since the previous Congress in 1981, six elderly members of the Politburo, including three general secretaries, Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chinenko. With the deceased duly honored, the way was clear for a new start. Gorbachev's Political Report to the Congress With lunch and coffee breaks, it lasted the rest of the day. A team of professional announcers took six hours to read it on Soviet radio afterward. Gorbachev almost equaled the new record for communist speeches established earlier that month by Fidel Castro, who had reported to the Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba for seven hours and ten minutes. Now seated in the guest row behind the general secretary, Castro listened carefully to the translation of Gorbachev's speech. It turned out to be the most critical address delivered by a Soviet leader since the end of the Stalin era. For a number of years, not only because of objective factors, but above all for subjective reasons, the activity of party and state bodies has fallen behind the demands of the time, of life itself, declared the General Secretary. Problems in the development of the country accumulated more quickly than they were solved. Inertia and stagnation in forms and methods of administration, decreasing dynamism in work, the growth of bureaucratism, all this made for considerable detriment to the cause. Elements of stagnation became apparent in the life of society. Such a critique of Soviet reality and the senior leadership had not been heard since Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech to the 20th Party Congress in February 1956. Gorbachev later noted that the 1956 Congress and the current one had begun on the same calendar day, February the 25th. The word that he used for stagnation, zastoy, would become the accepted term for the decline in Soviet economic development of the late 1970s and early 1980s. Gorbachev wanted the party to overcome negative aspects of socio-economic development as quickly as possible to impart the necessary dynamism and acceleration to that process, to learn the lessons of the past 
to the maximum. He set ambitious tasks for the Soviet economy and society. In 15 years, before the end of the millennium, gross domestic product, GDP, was to be doubled by dramatically increasing the productivity of labor. He staked the achievement of that task on the scientific and technological revolution, including the introduction of new technologies and a shift from fossil fuels, especially coal, oil and gas, toward nuclear energy. In the current five-year plan, declared Gorbachev, atomic energy stations two and a half times more powerful than those in the previous plan will come online, and obsolete units at thermoelectric power stations will be replaced en masse. Bruchanov knew the figures. They were part of the government energy program that had been prepared and announced before the Congress. But now the party had given the program a ringing public endorsement. In five years, the next party Congress would review the results, and the party leadership would punish those it held responsible for failing to achieve the projected result, should that become necessary. This meant that not only would the existing four units of the Chernobyl power plant have to fulfill and over-fulfill their quotas, but the new fifth and sixth units would also have to be completed and connected to the electric grid. There were also plans to build two and then an additional four reactors on the other bank of the Pripyat River. The production capacity of these new units would significantly exceed that of the old ones, producing 1.5 million megawatts of electrical energy per unit, instead of 1 million. After 15 years of juggling the tasks involved in building the plant and running it at the same time, Bruchanov felt exhausted, but the party demanded more nuclear energy, and he served at the party's pleasure. In his report, Gorbachev paid much more attention to nuclear arms than to nuclear energy, he called on his comrades to think about new approaches to arms control, pointing out that the nuclear arms already accumulated by the opposing military blocs, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the Moscow-led Warsaw Pact, threatened to destroy life on Earth many times over. His proposed solution was a program that would eliminate all nuclear weapons before the end of the century— now he reported to the Congress that he had received President Reagan's response to his initiative. Gorbachev considered it largely negative. Reagan supported the destruction of nuclear arms in principle, but insisted on maintaining his Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, a project dubbed Star Wars because of its focus on the construction of a space-based anti-missile system. The reduction of strategic nuclear arsenals is predicated on our agreement to the Star Wars programs and the reduction, unilateral by the way, of Soviet conventional armaments, Gorbachev told the deputies of Reagan's response, not without bitterness and disappointment. The Soviet leader knew that his country had neither the resources nor the technology to match SDI, which was still in the design stage, but, if realized, would mean another round of the arms race that the Soviet Union could not afford. He needed the money and technical expertise that were being used by the designers of missiles and nuclear arms to modernize the lagging Soviet economy. The scientific establishment was on his side in principle. What its members wanted was more money and continuing reliance on domestic know-how even if what they had to offer was more expensive and inferior to the technologies and equipment available on Western markets. The continuing Cold War, which led the West to impose embargoes on the sale of advanced technologies to the Soviet Union, lent weight to their argument. The government-funded military-industrial complex was eager to move into the economic sphere while maintaining its monopoly on high-tech industries and products. Many, including Gorbachev, saw this as the most effective solution to the country's economic troubles. The desires, fears and aspirations of the Soviet military-industrial complex and its scientific wing were articulated to the Congress by Anatoly Alexandrov, the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. The fact that he was the first representative of the Soviet intelligentsia to address the Congress underscored the symbolic importance of his position in the party hierarchy 
as well as the hopes that the new leaders were now placing in the scientific establishment. A tall man with a long face, a big nose, and a shaved, egg-shaped head, Alexandrov had turned eighty-three earlier that month. He was significantly older than most members of the Politburo, and older than all three of the general secretaries who had passed away in the previous three and a half years. But no one dared to suggest that Alexandrov was not fit to do his job, or that stagnation had become apparent either in the Institute of Nuclear Energy, which he headed, or the Academy of Sciences, over which he presided. He was fit, vigorous, and full of ideas. As one of the founders of the Soviet nuclear program, he also enjoyed considerable respect in the party, in industry, and in scientific institutions. When it came to scientific and technological progress, Gorbachev's wonder weapon for overcoming Soviet economic backwardness, everyone looked to Alexandrov and his scientists to show the way. They were the ones who were expected to deliver the miracle. Alexandrov began with a reference to Lenin and the attention he had allegedly paid to the development of the Soviet sciences, but his main historical emphasis was on the development of the Soviet nuclear program, led by Igor Kurchatov, the founder of the institute that Alexandrov now headed. Under Kurchatov's leadership, said Alexandrov, the first atomic bombs were built, and then, earlier than in the USA, hydrogen bombs as well. The security of the Soviet Union was guaranteed. Alexandrov neglected to mention the role played in the creation of the first Soviet nuclear bomb by atomic spies who had reported to Moscow on the progress of the American Manhattan Project. He particularly stressed the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. In 1954, soon after the creation of atomic weapons, the first atomic energy station in the world was established in the USSR. I wish to applaud its creators. The audience responded with loud applause. Alexandrov recalled historical milestones, not only to praise his predecessor and, indirectly, his own role in the development of the Soviet nuclear program, but also to remind his listeners of dangers emanating from the West. He argued against buying technologies and equipment abroad, reasoning that contracts could be cancelled at any moment for political reasons. He wanted to invest in scientific development at home. The automation of a small production unit at his institute offered an apposite example. We announced to the whole ministry, Comrades, if you order parts, please order them from us, said Alexandrov, eliciting a new wave of applause. Gorbachev, who had previously interrupted Alexandrov's speech with supporting and reassuring remarks of his own, now fell silent. He did not ask what ministry Alexandrov had in mind. He knew the answer himself. Alexandrov was referring to a top-secret ministry with the awkward name of Ministry of Medium Machine Building. Its minister, Yefim Slavsky, was sitting in the presidium behind Alexandrov, a giant of a man, five years older than Alexandrov and bigger and taller than he, Slavsky was one of the most powerful ministers the Soviet government had ever had. A pioneer of the Soviet nuclear program who had begun working on it with Kurchatov in the late 1940s, Slavsky was now in his 28th year of running the Ministry of Medium Machine Building, a huge government enterprise responsible for the production of nuclear bombs and later of nuclear power for peaceful purposes. Soviet leaders came and went, but Slavsky remained. When it came to political power and resources, he virtually owned Alexandrov's Institute of Nuclear Energy and, through him, the Academy of Sciences. Alexandrov's deputies were constantly knocking on Slavsky's door, asking him to fund their projects. He assented if he was so inclined. Slavsky and Alexandrov were long-time allies. Both came from Ukraine, where Alexandrov, the son of a prominent judge in the Kiev region, had fought in the ranks of the White Army against the Bolsheviks after the 1917 revolution, while Slavsky, the son of a Cossack, had joined the Red Cavalry. The fact that they had fought on opposite sides did not prevent them from forging a lasting alliance. The story was told that in the early 1960s, Nikita Khrushchev, 
had summoned Slavsky and Alexandrov to his office and, switching to Ukrainian, demanded that they catch up with America in the construction of nuclear power plants. Inspiration for how to produce a new nuclear reactor presumably came from the well-known Soviet comedian Arkady Raikin, who, in a stand-up act on television, joked that it was a shame to allow a ballerina to twirl without producing any energy for the socialist economy, so a rotor should be attached to her body. Slavsky and Alexandrov allegedly, after seeing the skit, decided to take a nuclear reactor designed for the production of weapons-grade plutonium and attach an enormous turbine and rotor to it in order to use the reactor's excess heat to produce electricity. Whatever the actual source of their inspiration, a new reactor called the RBMK, High Power Channel Reactor, was born out of cooperation between Slavsky's ministry and Alexandrov's institute. Its chief designer was Nikolai Dolezal, another native of Ukraine who had made it big in the Soviet nuclear industry and served as the director of the Research and Development Institute of Power Engineering. He had designed the reactor that had produced plutonium for the first Soviet nuclear bomb and had then worked on the reactors powering Soviet submarines. Alexandrov, who also worked on nuclear submarines, served as chief scientific consultant for the RBMK design. The first RBMK units were tested and run by Slavsky's ministry. Alexandrov kept telling everyone who would listen that his reactors were safe and sound. They were like samovars, he said, and could not possibly explode. Rumour had it that he went so far as to declare that his reactors were safe enough to be installed on Red Square. That never happened, but after the new reactor was tested at a plant in Slavsky's ministry, it was deemed safe enough to be transferred to the Ministry of Energy and Electrification, which had no experience with nuclear energy. Few doubted the positive effect that the fusion of science and technology would have on the country as a result of the military-industrial complex's stewardship of the nuclear industry. Alexandrov's RBMK reactors were placed all over the European part of the Soviet Union, producing much-needed clean energy for the country. With a capacity of one million megawatts of electrical energy per unit, they were more powerful than their Soviet competitors. The VVERs, or water-water energy reactors, meaning water-cooled and water-moderated, which had been produced starting in the early 1970s. By 1982, more than half the electrical power produced in Soviet nuclear plants came from Alexandrov's reactors. Three of them were built at the nuclear power plant near Leningrad, two at the Kursk plant, one in Smolensk, and three in Chernobyl. The fourth RBMK unit was launched there by Bruchanov in 1983. Before coming to Moscow, Bruchanov had been under great pressure to help complete the construction of the fifth unit, which was 70% ready. The pressure increased in January 1986 when the local party committee officially reprimanded Bruchanov's deputy for failing to meet construction deadlines. The news got into the local media, and Bruchanov knew that if the situation did not improve, he would be next in line for a party reprimand. In his report to the Congress, Soviet Prime Minister Nikolai Rishkov warned his underlings against any more delays in launching new reactor units, announcing, Considering the strain on the country's fuel balance and the growing role of atomic energy, such disruptions are inadmissible in the future. The appetite for nuclear energy, not only at the top but also at the bottom of the party pyramid, was enormous. Bruchanov could not help noticing that the regional leaders were eager to jump on the nuclear bandwagon, asking for investments of nuclear rubles in their regions. A party secretary from the Gorky, Nizhny Novgorod region on the Volga River argued in his address to the Congress for the construction of a nuclear power plant in his district. A delegate from Siberia attacked Moscow officials for killing plans to build a new nuclear power station in his region. Everyone wanted to go nuclear. The man who served as gatekeeper to the Soviet nuclear paradise was Viktor Bruchanov's immediate superior, the 56-year-old Minister of Energy and Electrification, 
Anatoly Majorets. New in office, he was eager to prove himself. Faced with the task of increasing the production of electricity at nuclear power stations by two and a half times within the next five years, he sought ways of fulfilling the task when the entire construction cycle of a nuclear power plant, from the start of architectural design to the completion of the reactor, took seven years. Majorets told the Congress that the cycle could be reduced to five years if the design and construction could take place concurrently. Bruchanov knew how difficult it was to deal with half-baked architectural designs not adapted to local conditions. Since few reactors were actually completed within the seven-year time frame, reducing it to five years seemed impossible. But if the party so ordered, and the state managers demanded it, the plant managers had no choice but to fall in line. Majorets finished his report on a high note. Let me assure you that electrical power engineers and builders, inspired by the decisions of the 27th Congress of the CPSU, will carry out the party's grand plans and make a worthy contribution to constructing the material basis of communism. It seems to have escaped him that the party was no longer building communism, but then, as a new minister, he could be over-enthusiastic. The whole atmosphere at the Congress was one of jubilation. Everyone wanted to think big and believe that anything was possible. Among the most optimistic delegates was Gorbachev himself. His report was received very well. His vision for the acceleration of economic development, based on scientific and technological progress, was endorsed by the Congress, and he was now elected General Secretary, not only by the plenum of the party's central committee, but by the Congress as well. His standing had improved, and his mandate to carry on his acceleration policies was strengthened. Moreover, Gorbachev was able to bring his own people into the Politburo. Among them was the energetic party boss of Moscow, Boris Yeltsin, who asked rhetorically, Why do we keep raising the same problems from one Congress to the next? Why, even now, do demands for radical reform get bogged down in the inert stratum of opportunists with party cards? His words sounded like a bombshell in an auditorium still full of Brezhnev's appointees. The word perestroika, or restructuring, was mentioned in Gorbachev's report to the Congress, but only once. The key word was still uskarenye, acceleration, which had first been introduced in official party discourse immediately after Gorbachev's ascension to power in the spring of 1985. Most delegates believed that they were on the right track, the problem being the stagnation of the Brezhnev era. The solution lay in a return to Lenin's ideals of true communism. The Congress ended on March the 6th. Viktor Bruchanov and his colleagues in the Ukrainian delegation packed their bags and headed home. The future looked bright, not only for the nuclear industry, but also for the country as a whole. But there was one thing that bothered the director of the Chernobyl nuclear plant. In an evening telephone interview from his Moscow hotel, Bruchanov had shared his concern with the Kiev reporter who had interviewed him a few weeks earlier on the occasion of his 50th birthday. As expected, he praised Gorbachev's report and embraced the new tasks assigned to the Soviet nuclear industry. But he also sounded a warning. We must hope that this will also promote greater attention to the reliability and safety of atomic energy generation at our Chernobyl station in particular. That is most urgent for us. The interview with Bruchanov appeared in the newspaper without that warning.